Good afternoon and welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Today it's my great pleasure to introduce a representative from the collective known as Frank Schaefer. I say collective because it seems unlikely that one person could have amassed a CV that includes all of the following. Born into a family of prominent evangelicals and helping them found the religious right in the United States. Rejecting that political point of view and becoming a vocal enemy of the Tea Party. Directing slasher movies. Becoming a New York Times best-selling author of both fiction and nonfiction. Becoming a visual artist whose work has been shown and collected around the world. A frequent guest on The Rachel Maddow Show with appearances on Oprah, The Today Show, Fresh Air, and BBC News. An in-demand lecturer who's spoken at Princeton, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. A no longer terrible father and a pretty darn good grandfather. But most of all, a thoughtful, reflective observer of the human condition and our relation to spirituality, religion, art, and the universe. I left out surviving polio and becoming a member of a Greek Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church, and many other things. There just isn't time. Please join me in welcoming Frank Schaefer. Hi, thanks for coming out today. I just live up the road here in Salisbury, Massachusetts, so it was a short drive down and um, a pleasure to be here with you. I'm going to read a little bit from this book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God. The first thing I'll do is just mention the subtitle is How to Give Love, Create Beauty, and Find Peace. So let me tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book um, as opposed to some other book or another novel or whatever it might be. I wrote a memoir seven or eight years ago uh, called um, Crazy for God that's kind of tracked my journey that was referred to a little bit in the introduction. I had written a number of novels and I'd been in Hollywood where I'd made four feature films after I left the evangelical world. And I had done everything except address my personal journey away from the religious right, why I left that environment. Uh, I had been my dad's sidekick for a while, flown around in Jerry Falwell's jet when the moral majority was getting going. Um, we had been frequenters of the White House when Reagan was there and Ford, uh, Bush won, and so forth. So we had been, as a family, very much invested in that. And kind of like Hollywood, uh, the evangelical world has a lot of nepotism in it. And so it seemed natural at the time, although now looking back it seems very curious to me, that I was kind of groomed to be my father's successor. I mean, how does that work? Only the British royal family and the mob works that way, but evangelicalism also kind of has that where the God business becomes kind of a family business. And so when I was 17, 18 years old, I began working with my dad on producing a couple of documentary films, which then went out into the evangelical world. One was called How Should We Then Live? And another, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, that we made with Dr. C. Everett Koop, who then became Ronald Reagan's Surgeon General. And by the time those film series had been presented in nationwide seminar tours, playing auditoriums like the Grand Old Opry or Madison Square Garden, and large venues like this where we were packing 10, 12, 15,000 people in a night, uh, my dad became a household name, not in the larger world, but in the evangelical ghetto. And uh, I, as his young sidekick, and this is a long time ago, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, became this kind of uh, person who was going to put in evangelical terms, receive the mantle of his anointed prophetic ministry, or however they would have put it. One day in the mid-1980s, uh, after he died in 1984, uh, through a series of things that I write about in this memoir, Crazy for God, um, I, I came to the conclusion that I had really taken a very drastically wrong step with my life. For one thing, uh, I was turning into a complete uh, asshole at home. I was hating every moment on the road. Uh, I, was, I had two little young children at the time and realized that I'd been away six months of the year, you know, doing God's work, uh, talking all over the place. And, and also had a real series of spiritual crises where I just simply did not believe what we were saying anymore. 
And so I really faced a, a dilemma because I didn't have any other way to earn a living. Uh, I had uh, run away from a British private school where I was in boarding school. I had gone home and become part of my dad's ministry. I painted and I was showing some paintings and pretty precocious in that field. But nevertheless, this is what I did. And the money was good. There is a lot of money in the God business, in case you're not aware of that. And, um, and, and so I didn't know what, what would happen here. But in this personal crisis that I write about in Crazy for God, I came to the conclusion that it was really uh, this way, the path out, or sanity. I couldn't do both things. And I couldn't do a marriage and fatherhood and live a life of complete hypocrisy, of, 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 of gradually drifting away from the core beliefs we were selling, both politically and also religiously. And so I got out as far as you can get away from the enclave that I was part of, this uh, sort of nepotistic inheritance of the Schaefer little empire, which it was at that time, and all the access to power that we had, uh, you know, dad and mom staying in the White House frequently, mother going to, to as, as Betty Ford's guest to swim in the White House pool anytime she was in Washington, yada, yada, yada. And uh, so I went to Hollywood, and we were living in Massachusetts already at that time, and I rented a, a little studio apartment and used the footage that we had cut, uh, that I had cut out of these religious documentaries I made to make a show reel and went off and got myself an agent and wound up directing four low-budget um, uh, Hollywood movies that if you stay up very late and, and, and go to shitty cable stations, you'll see. They're not very good, but it was, a, it was work. And, um, uh, it, it sort of got me over the hump. And then I happened to write a novel called Portofino, which uh, very fortunately for me got some really great reviews and got published all over the world and gave me permission to continue to be a writer. And I'd finally find something that I was actually quite good at, as opposed to these uh, kind of second-rate movies I was making, as opposed to this weird world I had just walked away from in terms of the evangelical ministry. And um, 15 books later or so, I'm still writing. And after this memoir came out, which I got around to writing when I was in my mid-50s, not having wanted to address the issue uh, of why I had left the evangelical world and my family's history before, because there are a lot of people who revere the Schaefer name out there uh, in a kind of a guru presence kind of way. I don't mean my Schaefer name, but my father's. And I hadn't wanted to just put up with the bullshit that would be coming over the transom, especially in the post-internet age uh, of email and messaging and all the rest of it. And so I'd kind of, OK, I'll write another novel, and I'll write on this subject and that subject. And when my son went into the Marine Corps and fought in Afghanistan, I wrote a book called Keeping Faith, a father-son story about love in the United States Marine Corps. I had never served. It wasn't political. Uh, and that got me on Oprah, and it became a bestseller, and so forth and so on. But I kept pushing back this question, even though I got a lot of email from people saying, you know, when are you going to tell your story? And when I did tell it, uh, the book came out and uh, did quite well. Uh, you know, Terry Gross did an hour program on Fresh Air on it and so forth and so on. But one of the things that happened is I struck up an email correspondence with Christopher Hitchens, who was a leading new atheist author. You may have heard of him, along with Dawkins and others, who write these uh, very anti-religious books. And uh, Christopher Hitchens liked the book, and he started writing to me while he was reading it, saying, you know, you're a good writer, and so forth. And it was very nice, because I respected him and, and his writing and debating skills and so forth. But when he got to the end of the book, he, he uh, actually called me one time, and he said, you know, I'm really disappointed. Because you, you, you left the evangelical world, and as I was reading this book, I thought you were going to come over to our side. He saw things very much in black and white terms. And uh, instead, I get there, and you, you end the book, and, and you're kind of uh, indecisive, and it sounds as if you're still a spiritual person. You know, why didn't you leave all this nonsense behind? Why do you still have this interest in spirituality, albeit not of the evangelical variety? Interestingly enough, I was getting quite a bit of email from evangelicals who didn't like the book, and I was getting quite a bit of email from people who were following Chris Hitchens, although I was talking to him himself in this case. And uh, what I noticed was on the subject lines in the first lines of these emails, um, aside from the ones that just told me what I could go do with myself, but I'm talking about the ones that I read on past the expletives, um, if you changed a word or two, they were the same email. They were from people who were, in my mind, increasingly, as I tried to identify what the hell's going on here, what I came to call certainty addicts. They wanted everything nailed down. And I was 
starting to think about what became the subject of why I'm an atheist who believes in God, which was that as I'm getting older anyway and have raised three grown children and have five grandchildren, three of whom live across the street from me up in Salisbury, Massachusetts, that I do daycare every day for as a kind of a stay-at-home grandfather, um, the more I have lived and experienced things, the more I've understood that paradox is essentially the fulcrum upon which all human life and experience turns. It, it, if you don't embrace paradox, you are royally fucked, basically, because everything is going to slam you in the face, taking away whatever that last certainty was that you had until you suddenly discovered that you're not so sure about what you thought you were sure about. And having been on a bit of a journey spiritually and professionally and emotionally, uh, not to mention fatherhood when I got Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18, and then, um, you know, had these kids so that my oldest granddaughter is the age of my friend's children who all waited longer and so forth and so on. But all this experience added up to what I write about in this book. <clears throat> so I want to share a little bit of it, just some passages, not chosen randomly, but kind of build a picture of what's here. And I'll just start with one at the beginning, though the book has more stories in it than it does uh, kind of this uh, non-fiction non narrative. But let me just kind of sum up a little bit of what I was just saying as I write it in the book. Um, and this is kind of, in a way, my answer to both my fundamentalist friends on the, on the right and the evangelical world and my fundamentalist friends, and I don't mean that facetiously, people who are my friends on the left and the Chris Hitchens of this world, though sadly he's gone. <clears throat> and I guess you could call this book an extended answer to many, many emails. My kale kaleidoscopic beliefs are fickle and motivated by desire, or wishful thinking, and wanting to fit in with my family and community and make my marriage work. My dogmatic declarations of faith once provided status, ego-stroking power over others, and a much better income than I've ever earned since fleeing the evangelical machine. Certainty made things simple, gave me an answer to every question, and paid the bills. With the acceptance of paradox came a new and blessed uncertainty that began to heal the mental illness called certainty. The kind of certainty that told me that my job was to be head of a home and to order around my wife and children because the Bible says so. Embracing paradox helped me discover that religion is a neurological disorder for which faith is the only cure. These days I hold two ideas about God simultaneously. He, she, or it exists and he, she, or it doesn't exist. I don't seesaw between these opposites, I embrace them. I don't view this embrace as requiring a choice between mere emotion and fact or between evolutionary biology and spirituality. Reality can't be so neatly parsed. Neuroscientists who analyze our chemistry-based brains still fall in love. Preachers declaiming a literal view of the Bible on so-called young earth still use petroleum products only found because geologists operate on the premise that the earth is 4.54 billion years old. I don't view my embrace of opposites as a kind of agnosticism. I view it as the way things actually are. An agnostic neither believes nor disbelieves in God. I'm not that person. I believe and don't believe at the same time. So that kind of sets up uh, something here. Now I want to go to a, a little passage which really I guess tells the same story of, of growth and uncertainty, but in a, in, in a different context, in a sense of growing away from the certainties about career path and the kind of picture I had of what success is all about and how I sort of would more measure that today. Picking up Lucy and Jack from kindergarten and preschool, Lucy's now seven and Jack is five, but this was written when they were a little younger has evolved into a happy ritual. I prepare snacks for them to eat on the way home, usually sliced apples or cheese and crackers for Jack, and a banana or black olives and sliced tomatoes for Lucy. The 20-minute drive home often includes a stop to watch the 109 Newburyport to Boston train hurtle under the bridge on Route 1A. Jack loves trains. When we wave, the driver sounds his bell and blows his horn, and Jack shouts, hi, Joe. He knows the driver's name from his many visits with Jeannie to the Newburyport station to watch the trains. One day, just after returning from preschool, the grandchildren were in the kitchen painting on butcher paper when a friend phoned. I'll call him Sam. Sam is a successful movie producer in Hollywood whom I worked with when I was directing movies in the 1980s. Although I quit the movie business in the early 1990s after I wrote Portofino and it was published, 
thus offering me a passport to a little artistic satisfaction and vindication, Sam and I are still close friends. We've bickered over our philosophical differences and exchanged insults for years. Sam asked me what I was doing. I just picked up the grandkids. I said without thinking, I added, I love hanging out with the other young mothers at preschool. Sam paused as he processed my words. The other young mothers, he said and laughed. The other young mothers? I laughed too, though my remark made sense to me. When I pick up Jack and Lucy, I'm one of the few men and the only grandfather at the preschool. Because Lucy's kindergarten ends half an hour after Jack's preschool, Jack and I have time to play in the hall or outside in the schoolyard while moms and a few dads come and go. At first, the mothers couldn't figure me out. Why was this old guy hanging around? Why was he unshaved with unkempt hair and torn jeans and paint all over his clothes? Should someone call the police? After seeing me every day for a year, the moms knew me. Some know that I'm a writer and an artist, so the paint spattered look is accepted. One mom checked me out online and discovered I've been interviewed by Oprah and Terry Gross on NPR's Fresh Air. Even a minor celebrity has accorded some eccentric artist slack, at least in the arts-friendly Boston area. I could show up in my bathrobe and slippers and no one would mind. I'm just one of the gang, albeit somewhat of a character. The mothers and I discuss one child's cold and how fast the rest of us are likely to catch it. We commiserate about the latest pink eye blight. We talk about one child who wakes up in the night and celebrate the quantum leap another little girl made with her drawing skills after discovering chalk pastels. We note who is pregnant with her second or third child and share strategies for helping a little boy who is scared of pooping because he's sure something is down there in the toilet. We congratulate one mom for finally getting a job with health care insurance benefits and commiserate with another about the challenging child care schedule of a night nurse. <clears throat> Some of the mothers are stay-at-home parents, while others hurry away from the office at lunchtime to meet their child, deliver her to the babysitter, and race back to work. Some have told me about problems with teenage stepchildren, previous marriages, divorces, and their struggles to fit into New England after moving from friendlier parts of the country. Some moms arrive in old cars while others drive new SUVs. No matter what we drive or earn, or if we're married, black, brown, white, single, gay, heterosexual, or divorced, when we get down on our knees at eye level with our babies as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. The child we're meeting touches the core of our being. Every mom delights in the pint-sized human shouting, Hi, Mommy! The shouted greeting that makes my heart skip is, Hi, Ba! I'm called Ba. Our shared experience of vulnerability erases the age and gender differences between the young mothers and me. We share a fearful solidarity, <coughs> call it the flip side of love. If anything awful were to happen to the child clamoring into our arms, the universe, as we know it, would end. And so with a passage like that, what I try to do is something that I see too little of in a lot of writing about philosophy and religion, which all is part of this certainty addiction that does not embrace the paradox. And that is, it puts it in these kind of didactic intellectual terms that is not where anybody lives. And what we all care about is our version of Lucy and Jack, whether we're married or single or gay, straight, whatever it may be. We have in our lives a completely different dynamic than the official belief system that we say we subscribe to. And it has to do with the people we love and what we actually care about and what makes us tick. And so what I've tried to do in this book is be as honest as I can about that and not uh, keep trying to act as if I have some omniscient view to share with people that will lead them to my truth as if somehow that's an exclusive truth. And to get away from that, I do two things. I write in this way as a novelist, as a storyteller, but I also then come back and describe what I believe or don't believe the way the earlier passage uh, landed um, that I read at the beginning. So I want to conclude just by going to uh, something here at the back of the book um, when I talk about um, the publication of this book, which, by the way, is one of the first books that I actually f at first self-published, and then it was picked up by a small publisher, which I think is the edition you've got here. But um, in the beginning, I did this because it was a book that didn't fit in with the New Atheist movement or the religion movement, which I think I talk about in this passage here. 
Spirituality is overtaking commerce while commerce looks more and more like art, the kind of art the Medici or Irving Penn, Homer or Miles Davis would have understood in which artist and observer comprehend one another, even respect each other and speak a common language. More young people, and a few old ones like me, binge stream made-for-TV programs like Netflix's traditionally crafted Shakespearean-inspired House of Cards, or the brilliant Australian show, one of my favorites, Rake, then we'll visit Tate Modern or the Whitney in a year. Maybe the future no longer belongs to the anti-meaning ideologues. Shakespeare has produced tens of thousands of times more than the absurdist plays. Miles Davis lasted, John Cage didn't, Duchamp's original urinal got lost and had to be replaced by one crafted by a ceramic artist. The museum wanted to keep their investment in a piece of art that was meant to mock the art market. The found object became the made investment. Damien Hirst's reputation is rotting along with his sharks. Daniel Dennett has a following, but even his followers behave as if their lives have a deeper meaning than plant life, no matter what he says to the contrary. And modern delivery systems <clears throat> are bypassing the critics and gatekeepers. Who needs another rotting shark in a tank of formaldehyde or a hank of cloth hung from the Whitney ceiling as a statement of something or other when you can watch QI, the wonderful British comedy quiz show on YouTube for free? It's hosted by Stephen Fry, who greatly, a greatly talented defender of good writing and music. Who would have guessed his musical hero is Wagner? A new generation is embracing human connection rather than debunking it. The liberating results are real. The geeks, bless them, are killing off the jaded, cold-hearted gatekeepers. When I was a young artist in the 1970s, I had to travel to gallery after gallery with slides in sweaty hand and beg for a meeting with the owner if I wanted to sell a painting. If the owner loved my work, I'd be invited back a year or two later, and he or she would put a few paintings in a show. I wandered off into the movie business and quit painting. When I resumed painting in 2006, in 2006, I worked for eight years until I liked my work enough to show it. I started a website in 2014 and now sell art directly to collectors. There are no gatekeepers in sight. It's just me directly in touch with people who like my work. The same goes for my writing. I self-published this book. Given the best-selling status of some of my previous books, several of my former publishers and several religious publishers were interested in publishing it. However, they wanted me to craft this book to fit their marketing strategies. Does it go on the new atheist or the religion shelf, they asked. Can you rewrite it to fit one market or the other so we can sell it? My answer was no, yet you were reading the book I wrote. I don't view you as a market segment. I view you as my partner, an individual reader, a friend, as complex and maybe even as conflicted as I am. Why should either of us fit anywhere? My liberators in Silicon Valley have freed me to write for you directly and to say what I want to say to anyone I want to say it to. The internet and its innovators are doing more to facilitate the reemergence of content-laden, craft-rich, hands-on hands art, individuality, and perhaps even spirituality than all the galleries, agents, critics, churches, and publishers combined. So I'll end my reading there, and you've heard a little bit of my talk. And I'd like to do a Q&A uh, because I find it's much more interesting to find out what you're interested in than just rant on up here about what I do. So if you have questions, by the way, I can repeat them. Uh, so if you don't feel like staggering up to a mic, just shout them out. And they don't have to be about anything I said. They can be about writing or you know, what it was like making crappy movies in Hollywood in the 80s or anything else you want to talk about. Uh, but uh, if you have a question, um, please let me know and I'll, I'll uh, try to answer it. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Jordan. Nice to meet you. Thanks it's, for coming today. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you write your books? How in the in what sense? Um, do you have a process that you follow? Yes, I do. I actually, I, I, I'm disciplined not by choice, but just by insomnia. So I've gotten on a weird schedule uh, that has nothing to do with our time zone. I wake up at about 3 o'clock in the morning. I find that if I write from about 3 until seven or eight. Um, it's my best work, mainly because I know I won't be disturbed, as in nothing else is happening. So other than a couple fishing boats that I see go by at four in the morning or five in the morning, um, 
just psychologically knowing the phone isn't going to ring or can't ring or won't, or that if I've turned it off, I'm not missing a call from something I want to do because no one else is up is very helpful. So I write early. I write every day, <clears throat> seven days a week. I'm superstitious. I don't miss a day. I wrote this morning. Uh, I was up at 3, and then my son came up and helped me install a new window uh, that's been leaking, and we, we finally got that put in. I've been working on this building project for a week or so now, and then I came down here to give the talk. But the writing had to happen. Even though I'm saying this makes no sense, it's going to make a crazy long day, I couldn't sleep if I wanted to because I'm on that clock now. So that's how I do it. It's just chunk, chunk, chunk. Some days it's shit, some days it works, but I got to get something down. Otherwise, it's like the day didn't happen. Um, can I ask a follow-up? Sure, yeah. OK, you mentioned that um, it seemed like what you found is that when you're reading pieces that people will write, sometimes they take sort of this approach where they're, they're not writing about themselves, they're writing about, right. and this is what God is in my viewpoint, and they right. don't really relay it through their experiences. How do you um, make yourself part of the story? How do you make it personal, or is that just how you write? No, I, I don't look to make it personal. It's just the way I write. So. Really, I only write two kinds of books. I write fiction, and the fiction is usually based on something that's happened to me. So it's thinly veiled, you know, like I had one sister who didn't speak to me for five years because she was saying they'll think it's us, and then, but it's different. And I said, well, it's different because it's a novel. And she's saying, yeah, but it'll still be like they'll think it's us and so forth. So that's the quandary of all writers. But I happen to process my life into my writing pretty directly, even in the fiction. Um, I have a novel out called And God Said Billy about a guy who comes out of a fundamentalist background. He's trying to make crappy movies. He goes to South Africa, where I was. He happens to make a movie in Namibia, which I did. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of cheating, because I'm using my stuff. But on the other hand, I think even science fiction writers do. Say they're writing a relationship. They still have wives and husbands and girlfriends and lovers, and they're, they're putting it all in there. So if you know a writer, you're going to see yourself in his or her book. You probably don't want to tell them much. Um, but when it comes to my nonfiction, I just find that I have limited myself to try, and I know this sounds, um, I don't know, pretentious, but I actually try to be honest. And so if I don't know, I say it. I don't footnote the nonfiction uh, unless it's just a historical reference or something in, a, in something like my memoir so people can follow up. And, and basically, I've just tried to let it, uh, you know, if I'm going to write about it, I try to actually have it a conversation and not, uh, not uh, be protective in that. So there's a certain vulnerability, and I think that that actually communicates with people because if you're writing about things from a point of view of like, here it is, and I've made up my mind, there's nothing much left to say. So I picture my reading answering me somehow and having a talk with me, and I'm writing to someone who, you know, I hope when they read my work understands they have a right to argue. Uh, and I hope they do. I don't know if that answers it. Yeah. Hi. Speaking of arguing. Yes, come on, oh, go ahead. Right, right. Just no. don't throw anything. Um, so it seems to me like saying um, I accept paradox right. is a bit of a cop out in the sense that you can understand there are cases where there are apparent paradoxes sure. where you things look to be in conflict, but if mm. you look sideways, you look at it the right, right way, they're actually not in conflict, and you can, yeah, can good resolve point. paradoxes that way. But to not actually try to resolve it and just yeah. say these, you know, X and not X mm. seem to be both, I just am comfortable with them both true at the same time. Right. I, I would almost feel better about saying, well, I'm not comfortable with it, but I don't know the answer yet, as opposed to just saying right. the answer is, that they're both true. I, yeah. I, I don't. Well, that might, be a, that might be a better way to, to, to put it. I think if you read the book, you know, maybe I explained myself better in the text, you would find that what I'm trying to say really is, I guess, the way to put this, and I don't want to be a downer here, but it's to acknowledge mortality and the shortness of time we have to make up our mind about anything. And so, for instance, you know, just take the fact that I get Jeannie pregnant when we're 17 and 18. Now we've been together 45 years, we have these kids we're caring for, and I love her, and we have great times, and all the rest of it. I have no clue who those people were back then. So it wasn't a question of good decisions or planning. It was just, you know, when I said, I'll pull out, I lied. And we got pregnant in an age when, you know, when you got pregnant, you got married, especially if you're an evangelical thing. I mean, it was the worst possible scenario. So now, you ask me, okay, you've been married 45 years, you must know something about marriage. No, I don't. Any more than I know about uh, love, how to define the word love. If you ask me what love means, it means that 
uh, I bring Jeannie a cup of coffee in bed once in a while. It means some days that I hate her less than I would otherwise when we've had another huge fight. And so one of us slams out, tires squeal, um, and somebody comes back, and you hate each other, and love that day. Passionate in love for years means we hate each other a little less. That's it. So when, when I'm saying about embracing paradox, I think really, and you make a good point, what I'm trying to say is the limitation of our words to describe actual meaning is so uh, vast that to, to, to say with certainty things that exclude other people when it comes to religion and philosophy and belief and so forth and so on, it's not that there's no truth. I'm not talking about rel being rel you know, a relativist in that sense. But I'm saying that our descriptions are very limited. So I'll just give you one other example of what I mean. You know, there's this debate about whether Pluto is a planet or, you know, whatever else it is. But of course, Pluto doesn't know it's being renamed. All right? So I think our human hubris of thinking that because I, we've named something, we own it. You know, mathematicians work in precise numbers. But without mathematicians, there would be no numbers. They don't exist independently of our description. So really, I just approach truth the way a writer does, and that is I look at it as a story. All I have is my story. I don't have truth. And there's a lot of ways to tell my story. And I'm not going to bash you over the head and say, I've nailed it. So that's a circuitous way to say, I hear what you're saying, and I kind of agree when it comes to the logic of something. But in terms of where we human beings actually exist when it comes to saying what love is or who God is or isn't and all the rest of it, you know, we are, we are feeling our way along on a journey. And we're not going to get to the destination. And I think that's the difference between embracing paradox and still enjoying the beauty and the intrinsic worth and the glory of life experiences, say, in a child or a lover or sex or whatever it may be, you know, that's where we actually do our living. So I'm just trying to say, OK, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, I've lived my life amongst wizards, political wizards, religious wizards, and others who had their systems and their truths. All the ones I got to know personally, me included, turn out to have feet of clay. And their descriptions were limited by the fact that words are simply metaphor, that ideas about truth change, ideas about beauty and aesthetics change. That's all I'm trying to say. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for a good question. Yeah. So I think Jonathan said that you are a Greek Orthodox now? I go to a Greek Orthodox church. In fact, I can read you a little something when we finish up here about that experience. So yeah. I just wanted to, you know, uh, why you go to a Greek Orthodox church, what you get from it, what does it do for you? Well, you know, I'm going to have to get personal again, because the thing is, for me, someone who would expect a theological answer, I could have done that 40 years ago when I thought in those terms. Today, I'll tell you the truth. Okay? I was raised by a mother who took me to church. So I feel comfortable going to some sort of community based on, on, on religion. That doesn't sound like a very good philosophical answer. Um, but on the other hand, and I'm not saying this to you personally, but I mean, I could put it this way. Hey, mom raised me that way. You got a problem with that? Do you have a better reason for doing anything? It's like falling in love. Why did I meet Jeannie? Because I went downstairs for dinner one night, and she came to this crazy community my parents were running called Labrie Fellowship. And she was a stunning hippie princess from San Francisco. She hadn't lis listened to Abbey Road. And I had it in my basement room. And we went down there. And 45 years later, she's still wondering what happened. So that's how. So I go to the Greek Orthodox Church because I feel comfortable in a religious setting of some. Okay. Aesthetically, I love the liturgy for the same reason I like Shakespeare and unfold around with productions. So I don't want long sermons and people telling me what they think. I like that half of it's in Greek and I don't understand it. That fits with my idea about not understanding anything. And I happen to also love, in the context of my grandchildren, being able to go to a place where little old ladies swoop them up, where they're growing up in a community where people know and love them, tracking with them, because there's not enough of that in anybody's life. We live in these compartments where you're in school and you're a kid, or you're a young adult and you're doing your career, you know, or whatever it is. I love it when, there's a, when one of my friend, Lucy's dearest friends is literally an 88-year-old lady who lets her help decorate the front of the church with her. That's priceless. Um, and so partly community. And then you come to the mystical desire to touch something bigger than ourselves. And that hasn't gone away with me. So I am still on a search for what that might be. And I find the, the solitude and the beauty of a liturgical worship service, which is anything but original, but very ancient, a fourth century liturgy of St. John Chrysostom originally. For me personally, to, with my taste that has nothing to do with what I'm telling anybody else to do, 
uh, I find I f a quiet contemplative space within that structure. It's all personal. It's nothing to do with telling anybody else what to do. Okay. I guess just to comment, it, sounds, sure. it seems to me like the crucial thing is not that you go to a Greek Orthodox church, but you belong to the community. I do. You know, and, I, and, and how else am I going to know when Anna Magamakis isn't feeling well? And how sh will she know that I just smashed my finger with a hammer, get a close-up of it, uh, right here, and that it's growing back again in all seriousness? And these are, the, you know, one of my best friends in that church is a night nurse that I'd never meet otherwise because she never makes any day things because she's sleeping. <clears throat> but we would do dishes every year together at the food festival. So for three days, we, and we become best friends. Kathy and I are bosom buddies because we're sitting there with greasy water up to our elbows, cleaning up after our major fundraising event. That's church. And you could name it something else, and it's totally available to you if you're an atheist. It's not a religious thing. But I'm still interested in religion. I still find meaning in prayers and rituals. And that is me. But it's not a system of certain beliefs. That I, it is a system of the, a way of being. Uh, you know, just like being a father or grandfather isn't about a theory of fatherhood. It's about, hey, when you look at your child, what do you see written in their face? Fear or love? And that's the test. That's the mirror, not the theory. Yeah. Um, so as you were saying, I mean, you can certainly go to church without believing in God. Right. Those are, can be related, but they don't have to be. Um, but so you were saying, you know, you both believe in God and don't believe in God at the same time. So aside from just saying, I believe or I don't believe, right. how does that affect what you do? Well, I'll tell you exactly how it affects it. It affects it in that I will, in my, in my brain, uh, whatever this amalgam of brain chemistry and, 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 and neurons and everything else is here, we don't even know what it is, at least I don't. Um, when it comes to trying to give philosophical answers of, uh, that, are, that are certain, you know, I leave myself a way out. Like the gentleman quite truthfully said, he, you know, my idea is kind of a cop-out. It's a cop-out. It's a way not to deal with what I can't deal with. I'm ducking the issue. But in my daily life, when I get up in the morning, um, the staircase down from my attic bedroom, I make my sign of the cross, because I've been in the Orthodox Church 30 years now. It feels natural. And I pray for my family on the way down. I, 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 pray for, I say, Lord, I offer you this day. It's a ritual. And I say, Jeannie, Jessica, Francis, and John, Amanda, Ben, Donnie, Lucy, Jack, Nora, and Becky. And that's my family and my daughter-in-law and all the rest. I have remembered them in the context of a holy, sacred thing. Now, whether that answers any big question about what's actually out there um, is a whole different matter. So it's the same thing when I see an ambulance go by. I make my sign of the cross. I don't do it because I think some miraculous healing will occur. It's because, God damn it, you know, a little human empathy never killed anybody, and it's my way ex of expressing that. It's, a, it's in a religious context. I hope there's something out there. I would like there to be. I would like there to be a witness to all the things we go through. Uh, and that is something I still work through, and I'm working on a new book about creativity and art and children, which really draws on that kind of spiritual reference point so many artists have found. But it's not trying to convince anybody to believe anything. I'm saying, look, I'm an atheist who believes in God in the sense of describing two halves of a, the same person. And one of the reasons I wrote this title was to provoke a discussion amongst certainty addicts who say, yeah, but I'm sure Jesus saved, my, you know, saved me from my sins on one hand, or on the other hand, I'm sure there is no God because I read Chris Hitchens' latest book or Dawkins, or here's the latest research on brain chemistry. And I'm saying to myself, wow, at what point in human history could you go back and say, draw a line under some cosmological statement and say, OK, that's it, they nailed it. Um, you know, if we were that, if we could do that, we would not continue to, to not only advance and evolve, but it's kind of a hubristic misunderstanding of where we are on the evolutionary chain. And where we are on the evolutionary chain, I mean, you know, it's funny to be saying this in the middle of Google that has, uh, you know, such a sophisticated footprint worldwide in terms of not only technology, but so many good things. The truth of the matter is we're semi-evolved primates. And we are an eye blink if you look at the history of evolution. I mean, 10 seconds ago, we were all in the slime as single-celled creatures. We're not at the position where we can stand up and start making generalized statements about anything. We can simply get on with the day and try to treat people in a way we'd want to be treated. If we could manage to do that, we would already be doing something. So all I'm saying is, hey, let's have a little humility and step back. And that is not born of some great philosophical insight. It's just realizing what an asshole I was as a young father compared to being a fairly decent grandfather who actually is almost ready for fatherhood now. 
I'm just about ready to have my first child. And, and that's because my grandchildren have finished a process of learning that no book, no belief, no religion, no making the cross, no nothing could have uh, supplemented. That's all I'm saying. I'm just saying it's a learning curve. So earlier you were trying to make a contrast between, you know, I'm not an agnostic, you know, I'm an atheist who believes in God. And right. Thing. And, but I mean, everything you just said to me sounds, I mean, to me, like what an agnostic would say, saying, well, you know, that, no yeah. ever, that crossing yourself certainly couldn't hurt. And yeah. That, you know, all these, I, wouldn't it be great for there to, you know, I mean, it sounds, yes. I, I'm having a hard time seeing the-, the Let me put it this way. I'll try to, I won't go any too, too much further with this because I can't do better than what I said in the book, okay? Which is stated better because you have time to think about it. I'm just off the cuff here. But I live in a world of agnosticism, but I behave like a believer. Okay, that's the best I can put it. I try to follow Jesus in terms of treating people the way I want to be treated. It's why I don't slap my grandchildren and even whether I lose patience or not. It's why, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a philosophy of life that says, look, you've got to choose some path. This is the path I choose. But it has nothing to do with saying, oh, here's the theological implication, and I'm sure that this is true because so forth and so on. And so it's just admitting that, you, you know, our beliefs and how we live are separate things, but the most important thing is who we are, not what we say. That's what I'm trying to get to. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Hey, um I just want to know, do you see yourself as, as trying to kind of convince people of your more like moderate view, or is it a total kind of do what you want, hands off? No, I am trying to convince people of a more moderate view because I think we live in a world today, and this doesn't take much thinking about. We're involved in a medieval holy war with ISIS and the Taliban and these other people. We had a president in George W. Bush who basically ran this country into the ground on the basis of evangelical certainty about invading people because they hit us first. We've got a history of involvement globally which is going to really keep hurting us for centuries. We live in a polarized world in which smart-ass new atheists are answered by greedy and hypocritical believers on the other hand as if it's a war between nations rather than saying in humility none of us know anything. And Again, to get very personal, my interest, my bet in this, my dog in this fight is not my point of view, it's my grandchildren. I don't want Lucy and Jack to be given a series of false, stupid alternatives. I would like them to grow up in a world where there's more people who uh, basically look at the process of being a human being from a point of view of not just some humility, but also compassion and empathy. And I think art contributes to that. Religion can and often doesn't. Philosophy can and often doesn't. Education can, usually doesn't these days because it's all about teach to the test instead of teach to the soul. So it's, the humanities go out the window. So, you know, and I don't say this just because I'm at Google. Remember, I wrote this book before I thought I was going to come, got invited to speak here. Uh, I didn't just put this page in for you, but I do believe that actually one of the hopeful things in breaking that barrier down is what Google does. Not only do I use Google day and night as a writer and a resource for everything, Okay, it's the only decent spell check system in the world, by the way. And I say that as a dyslexic. I mean, my, 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 wor my uh, word spell check never finds anything, let alone any of anything else. But you go to Google, if you even have a vague idea of what it might be like, you will get there. So it works. Well, you know, this actually changes everything when it comes to the point of view of a kind of combative approach to everything. How can you have certainty when all knowledge becomes at your fingertips? You, you, you simply have to have the humility to look into what you're doing and realize, no matter what I spend my whole life studying, I will have only scratched the tip of the iceberg. So yeah, there was the Harvard Library and places you could go and get a sort of a visual idea of everything was out there. But now, uh, someone like me who's not a scholar can type in something like the word St. John Chrysostom, and now I could just spend the rest of my life on that. That's a very humbling experience, and it should teach us something. So I'm hoping that my book is a little tiny drop in the ocean, that, that uh, why I'm an atheist who believes in God is just simply a kind of a statement that says, listen, you know, I haven't learned much. I've learned to be a bit of a kinder grandfather than, a, than I was a father, uh, maybe a bit of a better writer, but let's all step back from this war of religion we're involved with, whether from the new atheist side or the Christian side or the Jewish side or the Taliban or whoever it is. Do we really want to go down this path? And so to me, that's, I do want to convince people of that. I have an agenda. But it isn't, a, it isn't an in or out agenda. It's an agenda that says, you know, let's all step back a minute 
and, and take some of the foolish aggression out of this. How do you do that? Well, it's very difficult. People ask me about my blogging, you know, which I compare to cage fighting compared to actual writing, and you know, say, why are you sometimes so strong in that? Um, uh, you know, when you're preaching this kind of other viewpoint. But I think we talk it, and above all, we say it uh, to people as we are right here in this discussion. But then the most important thing of all is how we actually relate with people. Do we really put a c climbing ahead in our career ahead of human relationships? Do we really think the most important thing to do is earn money? Do we really want to, you know, always try to try to dominate the situation we're in and succeed in the terms that corporate America has lined up for us? Or do we want to succeed first as a human being? And that's really a series of small choices. It's not like a big one-time born-again experience. It's the little choices of where we spend our time and who we spend it with and, uh, and, and family and, and relationships between people and all the rest of it. So, I don't think there's a one big fix to this. I think it's a series of small choices and priorities in our lives, and that changes the way we actually relate to other human beings. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Hey, I'm Chris. Nice to meet you. Hi, Chris. Thank you for I, coming. I want to say first, I appreciate your admitting so openly that you weren't good at fatherhood because I'm also I'm now a father of two little right. kids and I suck at it. Yeah. And I'll, I I was going to say hearing what you said made me feel less shitty. It doesn't actually. That's not honest. Yeah. It does at least make me not feel both shitty and alone. So I appreciate right. that. Good. Uh, good. Thank you. I want to ask you, um, having formerly been an atheist, now being a churchgoer, um, I find it interesting. You've you've seen. You've had a lot of, of, of up close view of church behavior that was not helpful, right. was not positive. Right. And now you have spent a while in in a church right. where you are clearly getting positive value, or you you know no one was right. no one's holding a gun to your head making you go to the Greek Orthodox right. Church. I guess it's good there. Um, beyond the point I already I heard loud and clear from you of uh, avoiding the avoiding total certainty and mm. the aggressive asshole behavior that proceeds from that. Right. Do you have any other suggestions about how to avoid doing church badly for those who are interested in doing church? Well, yeah, in the sense that you first of all have to, I think, be honest with ourselves of why we're going. If we're expecting a magic pill that will solve everything, it will always be disappointing. If we expect perfection, not just in churches, but in any relationships with other human beings, in a church context, pretty soon it boils down to a congregation of one, and that's me or you, because no one else is good enough. And of course, you know, if you know yourself, you don't want to be stuck in any denomination where you're, the own, where you're the pastor, bishop, and confessor, and all the rest of it. So I think part of it is always being willing to settle, not just in church, but in any human community, for something workable where you can have a meaningful relationship with other human beings. I keep coming back to this, and not look for the kind of magic bullet teaching pill. Actually, I have a little bit in the book, and I promise everybody this is not a planted question, but I'll, read a I'll just read one little section because this we're getting pretty down in the time here. We have a few minutes, but I want this is an actual answer to your question. <clears throat> in the movie The Big Lebowski, the dude Lebowski, a single unemployed slacker living in Venice, California, is mistaken for a millionaire who is also named Lebowski. Thugs break into the dude's apartment and try to coerce him into paying a debt he knows nothing about. When he refuses, they pee on his carpet. Later, while considering the immorality of the self-defined nihilists who desecrated the dude's carpet, his friend Walter says, "Nihilists? Fuck me! I mean to say, what you want about the? I mean to say, I mean say what you want about the tenets of National Socialism, dude. At least it ha it's an ethos." Unlike the nihilist carpet wreckers, Walter, played by John Goodman, and the dude, played by Jeff Bridges, do have an ethos. They embrace this code by bowling. To them, bowling is church. Their means of establishing relationships with people who share their commitment to a liturgical tradition in a way that caters to their lives. And their church isn't perfect either, but they still go, even though it also includes jerks like Jesus Quintana, played by John Turturro. Turturro's hilarious Jesus is a pain in the ass, notwithstanding Walter and the dude still go bowling with them. They don't see themselves as too good for whoever else shows up to participate. The dude is into liturgical tradition. He practices his rituals religiously, which includes smoking marijuana in the bath, drinking white Russians, bowling and remaining faithful to his friends. The dude abides because he's true to his rights and thus to himself. The dude does not worry about his motivations, let alone his inner sincerity or the perfection of his bowling church. 
The dude is not trying to change his liturgical rites to make them hipper, progressive, or modern. The dude isn't a bowler because he believes in bowling, but because he bowls. And that's how I see the doing of community and faith. So yeah, there's a line. Hey, the Greek Orthodox Church is no picnic. I mean, you know, there's politics everywhere. Uh, some priest you love, you know, other people want to kick him out. On and on it goes. This is a human deal. But that said, I like the continuity of a liturgy that I subscribe to him and familiar with because I don't want new all the time. I want to go back to familiar things. So it's like the same reason you don't want to go to a home you grew up in and find they've raised it and put a parking lot there. It wasn't the greatest place on earth, but it was your house and you knew it. So similarly, I like tradition. So I would just say, you know, everybody has their limit of, of what they can take, but unless that limit is reached, the continuity of friendships, the continuity of liturgical service, the continuity of, of styles that you are used to is worth a lot in a world where so much else is changing. And it isn't just church, it's art. You know, one of my definitions of great art is that you want to revisit it. So if, 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 if you love a piece of work, one of the signs that it is a great piece of work, at least as it relates to you, is you want to go back. If you're just wowed by something, you know, the latest CGI thing on the IMAX, and it's huge and it's loud, but you never actually want to revisit that moment, that says something to you. It wasn't, it wasn't that part of that inner fabric that really matters to us. So, you know, those kind of quiet things that we like to revisit and really c contemplate and enjoy and be part of in community and people, to me, that's worth putting up with a lot of failure that doesn't measure up to the perfection, as long as that kind of steady stream of experience feeds us. So, you know, that's the best I can do. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hi, uh, Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Um, the way you described your daily habits, it would be really easy for the religious to claim you as their own and say, he is, he is a believer mm -hmm. who has doubts like so many of us right. have. What's the flip side of that where the atheist can claim you and say, yeah, he still has these tendencies to fall back on faith? Well, I'll mention two things. One, it's not in your question, but just to put it in context, you know, as, as someone who goes around the country talking about gay rights and, and, and accepting gay marriage and transgender rights and appears on Rachel Maddow deconstructing the religious right again and again and again, um, you know, the kind of ghostbuster thing, you know, who do you call? You know, somebody just said something stupid, so we'll get Frank Schaefer to tell us just how dumb. So I have a thing in the book that says, and I'm coming back to your question, you know, I get a call from something like the Maddow Show, and it's like, you know, they just said this dumb thing. And then my dialogue when I get on there, as Rachel says, they just said this stupid thing. And then I say, well, how stupid was it? And she says, very stupid. And then she says, and how dangerous is it? And I say, very dangerous. And that's my next two-minute commentary. So I'm not a friend. In the, in the eyes of religious people, I'm part of that enemy. When it comes to my own personal beliefs, I think that on a much more serious level, I'm someone who not only relates to atheists, but spends a lot of my time way past doubt and simply being honest about admitting that these rituals fundamentally are not grounded in anything that would relate to the word true. So for me, the truth, say, of the Bible is that things that never happen still can have a nugget of truth in them because it's a reflection of the collective human experience. And in the times when I have more perception of the divine, I hope that's somehow been guided. But most of the time, I wouldn't break it down in percentages, I simply don't believe a word of it. Okay, And that's an honest statement. I don't think it happened. And I don't think there's any way to, to make it so. So when it comes to an argument, a lot of my beef with the new atheist movement is style and hubris and arrogance and putting down long traditions that have tremendous value for many reasons, and not all new atheists do that. But when it fundamentally comes to the point that when I lie down and die, what do I think will happen? Usually I'm pretty cold-hearted to myself about it and say, guess what, the lights will just go out. Other times I don't believe that. But at the times when I do feel that, it's way past peripheral doubt to a system that I think is otherwise OK, except for my doubts. And then the last step I would just say is if, I, you, know, if you are going to have a faith informed by anything but that kind of doubt, then it certainly doesn't qualify as a faith. It qualifies as a, an addiction to some sort of certainty, because faith implies unbelief. And I leave you with that thought. So I think we're done. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Sorry I didn't get to your question. Thanks a lot.